I'm Cheryl Foster. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Can you also go into where you're from and your beginning journey as an artist? Well, I was born in Washington, D.C. at the old Freedman's Hospital. You don't know nothing about that, but the old hospital uh, near the Wonder Bread Bakery on Georgia Avenue, just south of Howard University. And I lived in uh, southeast Washington till I was about five years old and then um, attended Calvin Coolidge High School and Paul Junior High um, way back when and uh, was receiving my Bachelor of Fine Arts degree from Howard University's Fine Arts Department. Do you have any distinct memories, whether it be in middle school or high school or elementary school, of doing art and being an artist? I never was not an artist. I was doing art, I'm sure, in the womb. But my mother and father, although my mother was a teacher in the D.C. public schools, science, and my father was um, initially a policeman, uh, we always did uh, creative projects. I always say that my father was a hunter and would come home with pheasant and quail and squirrel and my mother and I would sit at the kitchen table and pluck the feathers off the carcasses and make Jackie Kennedy pillbox hats with beautiful feathers um, and because I eventually became a, a mosaic artist that's probably where I learned to take patience, number one, but take tiny units to make a total composition. And so I was the only five-year-old. At that time, there were poodle skirts, and the poodles had little fluffy tails, and they were wide circle skirts. I was probably the only child who had a squirrel skirt with a real squirrel tail on her skirt. but. Everything we did was creative. We went to the symphony um, uh, uh, orchestra presentations and I danced and was in newspapers for just clowning around um, underneath the stars uh, listening to symf the symphony orchestra. So I've never not been involved in the arts. I played uh, violin and, and flute in the orchestra and band in school. but. All of the schools um, had art programs. I was very lucky, um, although now that's all dissipating in many of our schools. We were taught to sew and taught woodwork and um, art was always part of my life. I guess um, I really became involved in eh, around the seventh grade at Paul Junior High School. I had uh, Miss Grimes who was an excellent teacher. Um, who allowed us to do collage and mosaic. And I love that. And so we would take um, just plain old construction paper um, and do images that were full color hue, hues and tones. And she taught us that. And she taught us the majority of um, what she taught us was take your time. Um, take pride in your work. And so when I started, when I graduated from uh, paper collages, I was doing stained glass mosaics, same principle, uh, taking a tiny unit and I, I would get my glass, stained glass, it would come in huge sheets and put it in a hefty bag and take a hammer, just beat it to death till I had tiny little bits because I never wanted uh, the typical mosaic pieces that come in squares because I was doing a lot of figurative work and designs that, uh, I, that had to be refined, the colors had to be refined, I needed tiny little bits, irregular pieces and um, you can't get that doing computer work with squares. Um, so yeah, that's where I began. and. I'm still at it. Yes. 
So other than the various art programs that you immersed yourself in and also growing up in a household where you expressed yourself creatively, can you talk to us about how being a native Washingtonian impacted your early beginnings as an artist? D.C. government had playgrounds all around the city, well-funded, well-staffed. And everybody I know, everybody in my neighborhood and in every other neighborhood would weave baskets, would build boats, and we'd go down to the monument, what's it called, the reflecting pool, and one day we'd have a boat regatta of these boats. We made the sails, we made the bodies of the boats, and other than, you know, board games, we work with our hands, pot holders, um, aprons, you name it, we made it. I remember there was a time when I had like 45 baskets in a closet in my mother's basement because, you know, how many baskets can you use? How many bread baskets? How many? They weren't a big like laundry baskets, but they were made out of actual reeds. And we had to soak those reeds and we had a base and we had to drill holes in the base and make it from scratch. It didn't come in a kit. We had to make it all from scratch. Now, I never, um, I never got tired of that. And between my brother and I making baskets, we could have had a booth selling baskets. We had so many. But sometimes it was the same pattern. But you never got tired of the uniformity and, and the pride in doing. It was, you I mean, they weren't unique. Um, they weren't from the Gullah Country type baskets, but they were ours, and they were ours this year and the next year and the following year, and my parents always welcomed them into our home as if they'd never seen us do a basket before, mm -hmm. and um, no one else in the world was making baskets like ours, and so Oh, when my mother died, we found baskets that she just held on to. Some of them were signed on the base, um, but it's what we did. So rather, and I never was a sports type person, but I could weave a freaking basket. Wow. That's, uh, I'm just, just from your description alone, I'm just thinking about those baskets and how, how exotic they look. Well, just... <laughs> In my head, thinking back, I'm titillated myself. <laughs> yes, girl. <laughs> so uh, prior to your interview that we're doing right now, we was able to interview the amazing Rafiki Morris. And he talked about uh, immersing himself in the art community. So the next question I wanted to ask you, when did you find yourself being a part of this big arts community that's in the DC, that was in Washington, DC, and that is still in Washington, DC, thriving. Never. Mm. I am not, I wouldn't say I am a shy person, mm -hmm. but I'm a shy person. I am a reserved person. And I never was part of any of the arts organizations. Um, I can't really tell you why, but I never did, I didn't do a lot of shows. I think Tomorrow's um, Art World, Tomorrow World's, it was um, Tomorrow's Art World. I was part of that organization and I still know artists today, but there were organizations and I just was too either not comfortable with my work or, um, I don't know, that's a good question. But I wouldn't say that, I don't know that anybody would say I was part of the art scene. I, I, I definitely wouldn't. Um, I know many artists older than me or younger than me that I greatly admire, but rarely are we in the same space. I, I know Rick because Rick is, 
has he and his wife have embraced me and um, I've been in their home and I've been in his studio and I loved every moment of that played with his dogs um, and admired his work and we can like email back and forth well, what do you think and he'll show me his work or I'll say Brick what do you think what does what this need and what kind of punch how can I give this punch whatever I can talk with Rick and Rick will tell me, no, you're going in the wrong direction or um, have you thought about this or thought about that and vice versa. So I think group wise, I have never been a part of a group. Individual artist, um, we have camaraderie. Um, yeah, so. I don't think, I don't think that I'm part of, directly part of the arts community. Thank you. Uh, so I was, I was requested to, to repeat that question again due to some movement upstairs, but you don't have to, you don't have to answer again. Thank you. For that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so prior to this interview, we was able to interview the amazing Rafiki Morris, and he talked about the art scene that he found himself immersing himself in. So the question I wanted to ask you is, when did you find yourself being immersed in, in the art scene within DC? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the next question that I would like to ask you is, well, first off, being a native Washingtonian myself, I would like to thank you so much for the River Terrace mural that, that you created because for as, I'm, I'm 24 years old, but for as long as I can remember, I remember just being in the car and always looking, whether it be to my left or to my right, and, and seeing that mural and just it always being in my memory, being a Washingtonian. So first of all, I would like to thank you for your timeless and impactful work. And secondly, I would like to ask you, can you specifically just give us a background on that particular piece and what was the inspiration behind it? And and what and do you get people such as myself that, that come to you and tell you how impactful Okay, one question in time. Oh, I'm sorry. I can't, you can see how wait a minute, wait a minute. You can see how excited I am. Well, well, oh, well thank you, first of all. I accept <laughs> thank you. <laughs> You're right. Thank you for cutting me off because I got excited. I will start with the first question. Can you just provide us with a background on the on the River Terrace mural that you that you created? <laughs> well, I didn't create it. Oh, sorry. I didn't create it. Mm -hmm. It was done with the entire community and young people from that community. Um, I don't know where I found the audacity to take on a 60, 70 foot, 20 feet high. I don't, I don't know where that came from. Um, but DC Artworks um, was around at a, at a time when, you know, there was funding available for it. Mm. And they said, you find a wall, we'll front the money. And so I um, found this amazing wall and an amazing community that was supportive of, yeah, put something on that wall. And I went to community sessions, um, PTA meetings, and I said, what would you like to see? And they wanted to honor the young people because like in every era, elders are worried about the direction of young people. And they had young people, they said, we, We've got young people in our community that are doing well. And we want, if you're going to honor anyone, we don't want, you know, another Martin Luther King or uh, Malcolm. We want them honored, regular kids. So there were kids who had um, lawnmower, they, you know, they had their lawn business. There were, um, I think there was uh, at, uh, Melvin Deal just across the bridge had um, a dance group. So... I asked, well, who are you going to nominate? I mean, it's not on me, you know, who, who would you like to nominate? And they gave me a list of, of just good kids. And um, so that's where the theme came from. 
And at the time, Mayor Barry had uh, the summer youth program. So we had children, no insurance. I don't know what I was thinking. No insurance. We're up on we're up on scaffolding that, that you know, two and three levels high, um, on two ninety five in rush hour traffic, and we're all just painting. You know, la 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 la. It was just a wonderful experience because we didn't know any better. We didn't know we had no business up there. I didn't have. I don't believe, I know I didn't have parental permission to put their kids up three levels, but yeah, let's climb this scaffolding and we're not worried about falling in, onto 295 the highway. And deer would come out of, well, there were more woods then than there are now. Deer would come out and we'd look down and they would be eating grass underneath the scaffolding and families would come and put blankets out and and uh, have picnics and ask questions about the process and um, it was a good time and it was one of the first huge murals that I'd ever done. I couldn't tell you today how those images, they were plenty of them were right on as far as looking like the young people and I think, I don't know where I was and some young man a man approached me he said I'm working at uh, I'm working at the Ronald Reagan building as security um, maybe that's where I was and he said I work with you on that mural way back when and my pictures on that mural so I bring my kids to see that mural and so they if they don't know anything else about me they know that I painted that mural and I'm in it and it was for a positive thing, which, you know, every parent wants to encourage that. So, yeah, it was a good time. And um, I get emails often about that mural. People who were raised in River Terrace, people who have memories of River Terrace, people who always have recognized the children that are in that mural. And... Um, it would be nice to, you know, I've seen a couple of them. It would be nice to see um, some of them again. And Melvin Deal, may he rest in peace, he brought a whole dance troupe in costumes when we had our dedication. And we danced, we danced, we danced. It was, we were all in a frenzy. It was just so exciting. And parents came and the people in the mural came and the people who did the mural came. Good times, good times. Wow. How, how does that make you feel knowing that a, a work of yours is still being appreciated considering that you've done this years ago? How, how does that make you feel that, that and it's being passed on? That may have been one of my first rodeos, but I've had many rodeos since. And the, most of my exterior public art is similar out in the community. But that was my first. I honed many of my artistic skills, my community engagement skills um, on that project. I didn't know how to engage a community I, and I never would have dreamed that it would impact so many people. When you're doing it, you don't think you're doing anything massive and wonderful and um, a gift because it's a gift to each community. You don't know when you, it's not like if I'm in a studio by myself doing a painting, it's not the same. You don't get the, the same thrill. and. I just don't always realize when I'm doing something um, how it's going to impact members of the community. So being at the beginning of my career, my mural career, um, when I think back over it, I did a good thing. Um, and I did it with so many others. So 
I feel kind of moist sometimes when I think about it, especially when out of the blue, I'll get an email and people, yeah, remember when, wow, you remember? <laughs> That's the thing. And you're, 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 chill, you're telling your children about it? Yeah, sniff, sniff. Yeah, I'm impacted. And it'll come out of nowhere because I never know where I've been. Sometimes I don't even remember where I've been. Um, but I, thoughts come to me as you're, you're asking the question. You know, I'm coming back and, you know, the feeling that I had then. And yes, uh, it felt good at the time. And it feels even better when people acknowledge you. I mean, everybody, you know, you want a pat on the head. Everybody likes that. So it makes me feel good. And evidently it made me feel good enough to want to continue to do it. And I have. For me, the last question that I would like to ask you is, was there, although you already expressed to us that you've, you, you've always been an artist since you've been in your mother's womb, was there ever a pivotal moment within your journey to where you, made, you consciously made the decision that I'm going to be an artist as far as it being a career and it being something to sustain you? Did you, did you ever find yourself coming to a decision? Um, it was something I always wanted to do. My parents weren't all that happy that that was something I wanted to do. And they supported everything I ever did, but eh, when you're having fun and you're 12 and 13, it's not nearly as important as when you're about to go off to college and you're going to, sooner or later, you're going to have to what is it? Cut bait or when well, anyway, you have to make a decision. Um, when I went to Howard, I didn't go for anything else. And um, I was very fortunate to be uh, my professors were extraordinary people, people that are in the history books. And so I knew I was doing something important. I was being trained by people who were highly skilled and uh, Howard prepared me, not just creatively and skill wise, but I remember, and I try to tell my grandkids this, um, nobody will ever know what you know, what's up here and what's up here, unless you express it, unless you're able to communicate it. And no one gives you any art job in public art without eventually you're going to have to plead your case as to why they should give you the $2.35 to do this work. So I had to make a decision in the seven, early 70s. Um, either I'm going to do this and go full force or, you know, my parents always taught me, go hard or go home, as they say. And, and so... I don't think I knew anything else when I made a decision to do it. And it's not easy. It's not easy to be an artist. Um, I just went full force. I think that I was raised that way. And so once I made that decision, I have not, I mean, I've been many things in my life to support my art. Yeah, many things. I'm embarrassed to say all the things I've done to support my craft, but it was always to support my craft. It was always, I was always going down one road, art, 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 and more art. And I will hopefully continue along this road till I can. Wow. Can you please talk to us about Shoot for the Stars? Ah. Southern Avenue. <laughs> um, I think that uh, Shoot for the Stars began with a dream of Beth Myers, who owns many properties in that area. And she uh, is invested in that community. So sh she donated the one of her buildings, a, a wall, and I think this was through DC Artworks also and Mayor Marion Barry's Summer Youth Program, which 
a lot of the young artists started doing artwork in his programs. So again, we are miles up <laughs> on a building. Um, and that particular image is done primarily in mosaic glass. And I think we were housed in, it's either Taft or Paul, Paul Junior High, in a room with no air conditioning, cracking up tile and mirror. And um, we were shooting for the stars. We were, we were in like 20 or 30 feet up. And um, it was three, I think, three children, young people from that immediate community who um, are depicted shooting for the stars. So they're surrounded by sparkling stars. And when you come down that hill from Southern Avenue going toward East Over, it's breathtaking, if I do say so myself, when the car headlights are hitting that mirror. It's just twinkling and moving. And people, I mean, the, the image undulates as you're passing by. And people, I mean, this is, people love coming down that hill. And um, I don't know how many young people, 20 or 30 kids, um, rotating in and out of the project. Plus, just people off the street would come uh, work. And again, we didn't have the burden of, do you have insurance or parental, I mean, permission to have your child up this high? But we didn't know any better during those times. So we, all we knew is we were on the wall having a ball. And um, there were some veterans. There was a veteran center there, and they would come help. Um, and it's still there. And... Um, it's a memory of another good time. You want to talk about in the neighborhood and this happened and that happened, but that was a good time. That was a positive outcome, a positive experience. And for some of those young people, um, I would hope that it kind of um, meshed and helped them get through some hard times because there, there are hard times for our young people. Um, Parents would come out and, and just strangers would come and give accolades to the kids. And then we hired a truck and had a reggae band and partied after dark in Southeast with, I mean, we went through the streets in, in a truck. And I think we had curry chicken. She just, she supplied all of um, the reception goodies and um, everybody when I see people from that time they remember oh man that was now that was a party and we were in the parking lot no tables no chairs <laughs> no napkins but we just were eating curry it was good mm. so Miss Cheryl I see like a, a beautiful correlation so prior to, to you answering this question and, and you describing the process and the background story for the River Terrace uh, mural, you talked about the same thing as far as incorporating the community within, within the mural and allowing youth to have an outlet to express themselves. Uh, I wanted to know why, for you as an artist, why do you value that within the creative process compared to you doing a mural by yourself. Why, why is it important to you? And why do you hold such value on incorporating the community within, within the work? Why do I value um, including the, I've never done it any other way. Um, I can't, I mean, I wasn't taught that in school. I wasn't taught mural arts in school. I've never been taught that. Um, I much, as I mentioned, I prefer being out on the streets, being yelled at from cars. Hey, baby, what's happening? Go, girl. I, you feed off of that. I mean, I do. Um, I like that rather than being in my studio with a radio. Um, 
And I will say this for up and coming muralists, people who want to be involved in public art. If you are in, if you have applied for a commission for a large scale public art piece, be it painting or sculpture or mosaic, whatever, if in your written proposal, which is something else I had to learn to write proposals, in your written proposal and in your presentation before the selection committee, you get points for being, for bringing the community into the process. And how can you not be involved with the community, with the theme, with the location, and then you're going to leave them with something they aren't married to or invested in? You, you, it's unethical not to include the community. So often, and I know this happens, that a something's dropped in a community's lap and now they're undropping projects because communities realize they have the power to accept or not accept art that's just plopped down in there. You better, you better go to um, the churches, the schools, um, and just folks on the street, walk those streets. Because how, how are you going to just impose a theme or a project on a community uh, and think you can get away with it? You, there are unhappy results, and there are unhappy results when strangers, and we're aliens when we go into, it's not our, very rarely is it our own community. Um, no one wants to hear that. Uh, it's disrespectful. Now, and now neighborhoods and communities know they have the power to say yay or nay, and they can nix an idea. So you can come in all highfalutin if you want. Um, you can be eliminated. And there are projects where they've put them in, like, and they wait tons and they've taken them out. So just from an old head, it's just, if you want to show respect to a community and do something, do a piece of artwork that is birthed out of that community, then you have to do, that's, that's part of your work. That's part of your research. That's part of what you do before you put pen to paper, brush to wall, it's, it's, it's a requirement. And if you're not doing that, um, you're not gonna make it. And that's everywhere you go. You just can't swoop in and then you leave your home in bed and they're stuck with what you've put on that wall. Mic check, mic check, mic check. Okay, next. Can, can we please talk about the work that was done at the Randall Recreation Center? Ah, the Randall swimming pool. It may be a rec center, I don't know. Um, I was asked by Byron Peck who is a fellow muralist, wonderful artist, um, to work with him on a project uh, at the Randall Pool. Huge wall and not a lot of young people to work with us. And 
I was going to do one half and he was going to do one half, which I had never had a collaboration. I don't think I had a collaboration at that time. So he knew I did mosaics uh, and I knew he was wicked with the paintbrush. So I painted an image. I don't even know if it had anything to do with the swimming pool. His side, kids were swimming and the water was frothing and it was absolutely gorgeous. And I did uh, a child, which usually I, I do figures and portrait work. And I had a bird, a huge uh, bird, an egret, I think, and its wings were covered with glass. So again, this is something glass does um, that ignites a wall and is inviting to viewers. So often people say, you know, as I'm coming down, what is it, 395, you just look over to the side, there's something that brings your eye to that bird. And it twinkles day and night. And uh, when cars pull into that parking lot, the lights hit it at night. Oh God, it's beautiful. I don't even know if you know what the figure is. It really doesn't matter. It's just something that pulls your eye over there. So um, that was Randall's swimming pool. So you also spent some time in, in Philadelphia. Uh, I'm trying to think of why I even went. Oh, there was a job. Somebody needed a muralist. Why I was pulled from D.C., I have no idea. But I was working on a wall at a church, which was the wall from hell, because they had painted it with latex. And I mean, the church just wanted to keep it nice. So every year they put a different kind of paint on, you know, enamel we had. There was no acrylic scene anywhere in that wall. Just whatever the neighborhood had. I think they just all brought any any half empty paint, uh, cans and poured it in one can and that's what they put on the wall. We knew it wasn't going to last, but anyway, they wanted folks in the neighborhood. So while I was there, I saw this guy. I'd heard about him, Isaiah Zagar. Isaiah Zagar is a mosaic artist who has changed the face of South Philly. So while I'm working on this piece, I'm working days, I'm working nights trying to get in and out of there, the gunshots fired and, and needles thrown at my feet and a good time was had by all on that street, 12th Street. And I'd heard about as the mosaic artist. I'd seen his work through the fence. Um, he was just going through South Philly uh, with a fury, just putting mosaics everywhere. And um, at that point, I hadn't done mosaics. Hadn't even dreamed of doing mosaics. And one day I saw this guy looking like Ichabod Crane that big, <laughs> with all white hair, white beard, white hair going everywhere, hippie-like, but more Ichabob Crane. And um, just something said to follow him. <laughs> and I followed him because I knew, I didn't know it was Isaiah at the time. Um, but I said, I bet that's Isaiah. So I followed him and I introduced myself. And we had lunch and I said, you know, I'm here for a couple of more weeks. I would love to work with you by day and do my mural by night. So I don't even know what kind of lighting I had out there by night. It might have been just painting by street lamp. But um, I work with him and I learned mosaics. I learned about coloring grouts. I learned about um, taking ceramic tile and putting a glaze on it in a figure and um, firing it. Um, I learned to do huge walls and he embraced me, he and his wife. I stayed in their home part of the time. Um, his father was like a hundred years old and uh, his father was there with us and he had dogs and every inch and including the toilet seats of Isaiah's house was covered with mosaics. He would put images 
cover them with mosaic and glass behind these images. And I said, you don't worry about our, it being archival. He said, no, I don't worry about that at all. So through the test of time, the photographs that he placed behind the glass started to be revealed because the mirror on the um, glass started to dissipate. And it was just so amazing. And so I said, you know, I can't take this skill that I've learned and drop it. Um, so I adapted it to um, the fine art that I like to do. And I came back to DC with the sparkle. I mean, I knew I'd never do any mosaics. Uh, well, I did mosaics, but my mosaics had to have that mirror because um, people, people appeared to love it. And meanwhile, they hated Isaiah, the neighbors, because they felt that um, he was doing more harm to the neighborhood than good. Well, and he was going to bring down their property values. But sooner or later, they realized, no, he's increasing their uh, property values because people can have come from all over the world to see Isaiah's work. And when he, when we break tile or we break mirror, whatever we do with a hammer, you have to put it in your hand a certain way and blup, blup. So you're breaking tile sometimes six, seven hours a day. So the birds in the neighborhood picked up the sound of breaking glass. And so when they, whatever tweet, whatever birds do, the birds in that neighborhood sound, they, they're, they're sound like broken glass. So it's like a chorus of flocks of birds sounding like broken glass. Magical, magical, magical. So yeah, that's where I first did mosaics. And so much of my work in, incorporates mosaics. And I'm grateful to him and his work because he taught me so much. And he makes a good Greek salad. <laughs> Reach this amazing point within the interview. Can you just share with everyone any upcoming projects and what you're working on now and what we can be expecting? Um, I'm doing personal work for the first time ever uh, in a long time. And um, what, we, what are we looking forward to? I would say that uh, I want my colors to be brighter and more pure. And um, the ideas that are in my drawing books or on sheets of paper or written on scraps of this and scraps of that. Um, I somehow will always work large. It's in my DNA. So all the paintings that I do are <laughs> huge. They're just huge. And uh, so that's what can be expected from Cheryl Foster. More of the same, only better and brighter. And um, some of my own thoughts. When you're a muralist and going into a community, you serve them. That's your job. That's your main job. And I've done it for so long. And that doesn't mean that during that time, I didn't have my own thoughts. I didn't have my own dreams. Uh, I didn't have my own images. So while I can still hold a brush and um, work and translate that into something on canvas, um, I'm just, that's, that's where I am now. That's what I'm driven to do. So, um, before I can't anymore, that's what I'm going to do. So I've got another 20, 30, 40 years to do that. Yes. And that's what I'm going to be involved in. Another 20 years of more masterpieces and impactful ones. <laughs> oh, <laughs> from your mouth. <laughs> uh, yes, we'll put it out there. Um, thank you so much, Michelle. This has been a wonderful conversation. Just... Thank you for sharing your experiences, your wisdom, for being an inspiration. 
the artists all around. Wisdom, huh? Yes, Ooh. wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.